Um, all right, this is uh, the Bureau of Networks and Observations, and uh, what we're going to do today, I'll give a little overview. Uh, we will have reports from the committees. Uh, two of them will actually be from the committee heads, and two of them I'll uh, sort of present their, uh, their slides a bit, with a bit of improvisation. Um, then I'd like to just uh, discuss a little bit uh, the results from the IAG questionnaire to the services. Uh, this was something that uh, Zoo here uh, issued and got returns back. And I just want to go through a little bit about the about the networks to uh, show you what's uh, what's happening, and then I want to have a little discussion on the role of the bureau if we have time to get there. What is this? What I like to shoot? Can I have the next slide? All right, so the role of the Bureau, uh, we advocate for the expansion and upgrade of Space Geodesy Network, uh, of course, for the maintenance of the uh, reference frame, but also for the other priorities of GIGOS. Uh, try to enlarge our partnership uh, to build our network infrastructure. Uh, we organize and expand uh, what we have is the GIGOS affiliated network, and we have lots of partners in that. Uh, we monitor network status and try and make uh, predictions. I know we've made predictions in the past, and uh, uh, they've uh, they've been a little disappointing. But uh, maybe we'll do better now. Uh, uh, we have a, a, a the, the Plato Group conducts simulation studies and analysis analyses. There'll be a report on that. Uh, there'll be a, a, a talk on the uh, uh, metadata systems. Uh, being developed uh, uh, that uh, hopefully will uh, encompass uh, all of the techniques eventually. Next. Uh, we uh, enhance and improve the knowledge of local ties, and you'll hear from Ryan Hippenstiel to talk about that. Uh, we advocate and coordinate exchange of information uh, as uh, with the space missions, uh, and uh, we have a uh, a committee that's uh, working on that. Uh, we provide opportunities for representatives from the services and the standing committees to meet and share progress, et cetera. Obviously, uh, we haven't done uh, much of that in the last last two years. Uh, we have talks, posters at bureaus, uh, EGU, AGU, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we write uh, letters of recommendation, uh, letters, documentation to support stations, uh, current new missions, analysis centers, uh, whoever needs one to help support his position. And we also have this other item, which we call formulate a network development plan to address the GIGOS requirements, which is something I'd like to talk about at the end. All right, the next. So the recent activity, we uh, gave posters at AGU, the IAG symposium. Uh, we actually completed a memorandum of cooperation with Roscosmos uh, for closer cooperation with the ILRS and the GIGOS. Um, it, uh, the discussion was hoped that uh, we would be able to work more closely uh, with the Russian stations uh, in not only in the data, data processing, but also in engineering uh, to see if we can help uh, address uh, some of the present issues. Uh, we su we've supported the uh, uh, development of the GIGOS website. Um, we've, uh, as I've said before, uh, monitored the network status and made predictions. Um, and once again, letters uh, and development to support documentation to support uh, stations, missions, et cetera. And then uh, we'll have the reports from the committees, which will go through the individual activities. All right, next. And plans for the next year I follow pretty much uh, the same thing. Uh, advocating, recruiting, monitoring, uh, standing committees, letters and documentation, and uh, uh, opportunity, hopefully there'll be opportunities to get together this year. Okay, uh, this is uh, the uh, Mission Standing Committee, uh, <coughs> Roland Pale, <coughs> and uh, C.K. Shum. All right, next. All right, um, 
This, this committee has been working on uh, missions and their relevance to GIGOS and which ones they think would might be uh, most important, which ones they might, we might support for, uh, uh, for coming to realization in the future. So they're, they're evaluating the current and near-term satellites to the GIGOS 2020 goals, uh, trying to uh, rate uh, sort of their, their importance to GIGOS. And in particular, uh, supporting missions in the future that uh, that they think would would provide uh, uh, support to GIGOS. Uh, their contributions uh, they point in uh, they point in here that there are joint uh, ESA NASA uh, uh, projects under activity. Some uh, there are science studies with China, uh, and uh, they see uh, you know, a lot of possibility here. Okay, the next chart. Uh, see, if I press the next button, see if the whole thing will come out. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so they, they pointed out the uh, user needs, which I think we're probably very, uh, very familiar with. And, uh, uh, but uh, there are mission proposals, uh, e-motion, uh, mobile, uh, and uh, push the next button, please. And also there are, uh, joint activities going on studies. Uh, these are uh, some of these are low low configuration. Some of these are high low configuration. Some of these are combination, both high low and low low. And one in particular, I think, has a, a gravity radiometer. So there's a, a lot of action going on here. The different, and, uh, and we'll we'll see who uh, who wins out. Uh, but uh, there should be. Uh, missions, mission or missions, uh, with uh, considerably improved uh, the data products in, in the gravity field. Next one. Uh, this is just uh, some additional information about uh, some of the applications, the current uh, sea level rise, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, th this is a uh, so this is just uh, you know, studies that are going on. Um, push the next button. And these are these are some other constellations. So I pointed out single pair, double pair, pendulum, high low, et cetera, et cetera. So there are uh, you know, a lot, a number of configurations here, and uh, hopefully they will um, some, something will come to fru fruition. And so the goals right now are for those who are proposing and those who are studying is to narrow down the trade space and the interaction with uh, uh, to the different studies and identification of optimum setup regarding science return, et cetera, et cetera. So lot, lots of activity going on. And once again, hopefully will uh, lead to uh, one or more of these coming to fruition. Right, the next chart. Uh, okay, and here's just some uh, documentation to assure us that these things are going on. Next, these are the teams here. This is the uh, Europe uh, uh, Sino-European study team, uh, and uh, it looks like it has a lot of activities. Uh, groups in Europe and groups in in China uh, working together on several options. And the next. Um, some more documentation on next generation gravity missions. This one scans the Sino European uh, project and showing the, uh, the benefit that they would expect if it, if it does come to fruition. Next one. All right, another activity that these folks are involved with, uh, and I know they've been involved with this for many years, uh, is the um, the possible formation of an international altimeter service. And uh, I know that uh, some of us remember this back 20 years ago, maybe even more than that. Uh, but in fact, um, there's, uh, there are many applications, of course, for altimetry. And uh, this group is working with others in the hope of trying to formulate a, uh, an altimeter service. 
Uh, this uh, altimeter, of course, is a little different from the other services. The other services, of course, uh, are uh, yeah. This is uh, a little different in the sense that in this case, the way this has worked in the past is data usually goes to particular um, uh, investigators and, and, uh, and they do their work. So it's a, it's a, a little different from the, uh, uh, the open data policy that we have for some of the other services. But uh, these folks will work out the best, the best they can. Next. And this uh, somewhat documentation, uh, the feasibility of establishing the international altimeter service is being studied in the activities of the IAG, Subcommission 2.5, Satellite Altimetry, and uh, SC 2.5.3. So this uh, activity going on, and where it will go, uh, time will tell. All right, the next. Okay, so planned work. Uh, their activities were uh, significantly hampered by the pandemic, as were the activities for many of the rest of us. Uh, they are now uh, trying to set up a new concept for the standing committee to increase participation uh, by uh, potential uh, members. Uh, these days, uh, DK and Roland have really been the, uh, the main drivers of this committee and uh, they'd like to try and expand it. Uh, and they're working with the coordinating office to set up and maintain a satellite missions committee section on the website. And uh, they, they, are, they advocate, are advocating supporting national and international space agencies in their processes toward uh, uh, future gravity missions by providing material and uh, tracking parts and studies that support their realization. So they're trying, trying outreach uh, to try and ex expand, uh, expand their activity and expand their membership. Next. Okay. Okay. Um, I can ask for questions. I'm not sure I'd be able to answer too many in depth about the missions themselves. Okay, all right. All right, the, the, uh, the next presentation is uh, on metadata. Uh, Nick Brown in uh, Geoscience Australia and Sandra Blevins from NASA. Um, this is the uh, metadata activity at Geoscience Australia. And uh, Nick, has, Nick and Sandra have provided this. Um, so Geoscience, many of you know, Geoscience Australia is leading a, uh, a global initiative uh, to identify and meet user requirements for fundable, accessible, uh, interoperable, and reusable, commonly called FAIR, geodetic data. Um, this is uh, an activity going on for a while in the hope of developing a, a metadata scheme that uh, would work uh, not only for the, our geodesy needs, uh, for instance, of the, of the different services, uh, but also more general geodesy needs, whether it's in uh, agriculture, whether it's in oceanography, whatever else. So their activity will use uh, the, uh, the geography markup language, uh, the, uh, which is an encoding uh, specification to express uh, geophysical features. And uh, they've uh, conducted the user requirements survey, uh, most recently they conducted the user requirements survey across a whole spread of all, all the applications. Uh, so it's uh, not, only, not only geodesy, it's uh, all the other folks who might want to be a part of uh, this metadata system for geodetic locations. And um, they've gotten uh, 100 responses already to a questionnaire that they had put together. And uh, the responses had, had issues on uh, data standards, technology, security, 
uh, performance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what they're hoping to do is to provide a, a fit for purpose uh, meta, metadata profiles for user sectors. So if you if you one for agriculture, one for geodesy, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that's to meet the, the current and future needs of that particular community. So um, it's, to me, it, uh, it seems rather ambitious and uh, it will probably take a long time, but if they can put it together, I think it would be a, a, a wonderful improvement. Uh, a working group at the IGS Infrastructure Committee is working with Geoscience Australia to see how this would fit into the IGS needs. And then the hope is that it would, could end up being sufficiently flexible to meet the needs of other services. So I think that some of you may already be working with the Geoscience Australia group, and um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I was hoping that I could get Nick to uh, give the talk at this, uh, this meeting, and uh, maybe we can catch him, catch him next time. Uh, next slide. We also have an activity, CDIS at NASA. So CDIS is currently progressing, and they're currently implementing their ongoing tasks. Uh, they're uh, reprocessing and re-ingesting uh, data, and derived products for all the CDIS geodetic techniques. That's the GIGOS, I'm sorry, the uh, DARAS, GNSS, SLR, VLBI. Um, and they've ingested most of the data uh, covering the techniques, and uh, they're also they're working on the data products. Um, what else can I say? And um, so they continue to collaborate with uh, some of the other NASA teams to receive and ingest uh, ac active new data products sets, uh, continuing uh, the uh, GNSS the geodetic displacement time series, daily PPP tropospheric estimates, uh, transient earthquakes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all the new data products ingested and archived at the CDDIS will have a, a CMR collection record, a CDIS uh, landing page, et cetera, et cetera, and registered DOI. CDIS management will be working to enhance and update all collections uh, and the data. Uh, in the Common Metadata Repository and with the guidance of uh, uh, NASA Impact Analysis and Review of CMR um, project team. Um, I've, I've gone to meetings on this, oh, it must have been 10 years ago, and, uh, and when these, uh, which these ideas were, were discussed and formulated, and it probably dates long before that. Um, the, the, the concern I have, of course, is building a product that uh, satisfies everybody's needs uh, is really a, a big job. And um, I, I have a little bit of concern that um, it's a big enough job to take a long time. Okay, I think that's the last slide. On that. All right, um, not that I could elaborate much, but if you had any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Okay, uh, the, the next talk is has to do with the response to the IAG questionnaire. Um, and uh, this is a questionnaire that was circulated by Zuhair uh, a year and a half ago or so uh, to the services. And what the question was is, uh, you, we've told you what we need for GEOS. And uh, why don't you tell us in what you would need in order to be able to address that? Uh, I'm gonna focus mainly on the networks. I mean, there are also responses that came in terms of uh, analysis centers, data centers, et cetera. But since we're, mainly networks, I thought I'd focus on that. Next. Okay, you all remember uh, the baseline requirements, 2020 baseline requirements. The uh, 
one millimeter uh, accuracy, tenth of a millimeter stability over 10 years, et cetera, et cetera. And this was, as we recall, was mainly driven by sea level rise, but many of the other applications were very close behind. And uh, so it was supposed to be a global 24 hours a day, et cetera, et cetera. And that was supposed to be derived by our uh, satellite uh, and uh, space products. And of course, now adding a gravity field. Okay, next. Uh, in, in response to these needs, uh, Pavlis and, and others have done studies and have told us that we, uh, we need to have uh, uh, 32 globally distributed SLR sites, well positioned, new technology, et cetera. Uh, 24 distributed VLBI, well positioned, new technology, uh, co-located with SLR and uh, enough uh, GNSS uh, st uh, stations to track the, uh, track the satellites uh, pretty much full time. GNSS satellites full time. And um, also we have to recognize that uh, the idea was to be based on core sites. Uh, and, uh, but in, in the meantime, until we get there, if we ever do, uh, we're gonna have a mix of uh, not only technologies, but a mix of, of core and co-location sites. Co-location sites being those that might, that would have an SLR or a VLBI and the other, and the uh, GNSS and maybe DARS. And okay, let's take a look at the next slide. So um, we took a look at some of the responses that we got uh, from each of the services. And uh, this was the, the SLR network. Uh, it has on it uh, the, the current stations in black. It's, it has on it uh, stations that are being uh, uh, upgraded in SLR that we expect to be online soon, future SLR stations, and uh, in areas where new stations would be appreciated. So what you can of course see here is there are uh, large gaps at the moment that have uh, no coverage. Uh, there are some areas that are very dense, have lots of stations conveniently located to each other. So we've got a you know, poor geographic dis distribution uh, we've got a, a mix of new and old technologies. Uh, this is not a standard design uh, as you have pretty much in some of the other techniques. Uh, it's a mix of performance, and I'll show you that in a moment, and it's a mix of temporal coverage. And by that I mean some stations can operate three shifts a day and some have a problem operating one shift a day. Next. This is a measure of performance. This is actually uh, minutes of day, minutes of data taken uh, by, the, by the stations over a year. And uh, 525,600 minutes per, per year. And so this takes a look at it in terms of uh, data per year. And you can see a uh, very large uh, discrepancy, a very large difference in performance. Uh, those stations on the, on the left uh, are fairly well performing stations, providing data, providing data for uh, the uh, reference frame. Uh, and those on the right are uh, still, still developing or, or do not have sufficient funds to operate very much. Uh, but in fact, uh, and if, and in fact, don't really provide much much data and don't have a lot of impact on the uh, on the data products so probably half of these provide uh, you know, very little info very little data uh, and but uh, hopefully uh, will be improving shortly next so this is the response that we got back um, we have 40 SLR stations. 20 of them contribute data consistent, consistently. Uh, 15 of them uh, have data sufficient to participate in the ITRF. Uh, and we have some of the other stations that, that don't meet uh, the 15 station criteria um, do uh, 
provides provide data for uh, gravity missions uh, uh, and uh, altimeter missions and such. So they're still making a contribution, but it's not serving in the gravity field. Uh, so their needs here are obvious. Uh, need to improve the performance of the lagged stations. Um, and uh, that, of course, helps us where we are. Uh, but in addition to that, they've identified uh, where they'd like to see core, seats, core sites and co-location sites. And uh, uh, it'll be pretty much with the other techniques, too. We're talking about the Latin America, Africa, Canada, Middle East. Uh, I guess we really, really reached out and said, how about Diego Garcia? Uh, and even some room in, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and uh, the, some of these stations need to be upgraded into high repetition rate systems. Um, we also have um, co-location sites. Some of them are coming along. There are uh, two in India that are, are being built at the moment. Uh, I'd like to see a couple more in China, some in the Pacific, once again, Middle East, Africa, et cetera. So there are, uh, that, that map indicated in general some locations where we need to see uh, see some improvement in the network. Uh, in terms of cost of a SLS site, uh, uh, they were in the range of five to ten million dollars. Uh, of course, that, that depends how much of the site is already there, how much infrastructure is there, etc. And uh, the cost of running a site is uh, goes from two fifty to six hundred k, depending upon the location, and the organization. So from this, you can take a look at the number of stations, take a look at the costs, and uh, it's uh, pretty easy to get to uh, I don't know, $100 million or $150 million. So we get some idea of what would be needed to give these folks uh, what, what, what they think they need. The next slide. Uh, it, so this is the, uh, from the report on the, the VLBI service um you know once again there is uh, they're building up the the network uh still there are geographic gaps and you'll notice a lot of the same geographic gaps that we talked about in the in the ilrs uh, uh, certainly in uh in the south and central america in africa in uh in the in the northern area canada northern russia uh, over the ocean the uh, ocean areas the pacific and the atlantic uh, so there's still a lot of gaps. Uh, in the VLBI, uh, there's some mix of technology. Of course, they have the legacy systems, the SX systems, and also the uh, the, the, uh, the new systems. Uh, and so the network is a mix. They they do work together. They do collect data together. But one would expect that over time, uh, things will uh, continue to to uh, to, uh, to emerge. Uh, they also have an issue of temporal coverage, which I should have mentioned with the SLR. Uh, that is systems that are operating but do not run uh, 24 hours a day and, and have uh, you know, significant lapses in time of operation, uh, usually due to, to, to funding. Uh, the next uh, shot. Okay, this of course is the evolution of the VGAS network. Uh, a lot of activity happening here, some that are operational, some of the way pieces are built and they're starting to assemble, some of them are in the planning stage. Uh, so this hopefully it will also mature over time. Uh, and one hopes, of course, that the uh, SX systems will mature into the VGAS net, into the VGAS systems and uh, lead to for the very large increase in capability. Next, the next, uh, picture. All right. Um, so the their network has uh, about 30 IVS stations and some cooperating stations. They rate about half of them as operating very good, and uh, another 35 or 40 percent running good. Um, and they've they've mentioned here that they've got uh, frequency of operations. Uh, 13 stations that do run. Uh, uh, 40 to 124 days a year, and seven run 20 to 39, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that there are stations that are operating, but uh, they may only be operating to uh, you know support a particular campaign at a particular time. And usually that means that they don't have funding you know to to run it 
uh, to rent more. Uh, cost of operations, they estimate are about uh, um, two million dollars. Uh, presumably, that's a year. Cost of operations uh, for a site uh, of uh, for geodesy only applications. And their needs, they need uh, ten new sites. Uh, once again, primarily in South America, in Africa, in the Pacific region, and uh, they have to improve the cost of temporal coverage. And uh, they would expect that over time, more of the stations would become VBUS capability. Okay, uh, next. Right here, uh, they have very nicely uh, looked at what it would cost in new investments. Uh, and that's in two parts. Uh, one is um, the required to uh, bring stations, current stations, up into 24-7 operation. And uh, the second is to replace uh, or to add stations where capability is not present. And, and once again, you're, you're in the, uh, you know, the, the $100 million plus range uh, in order to, to fill this out. So uh, obviously, this doesn't happen in one step. It would happen over time. and. Uh, and, and once again, uh, we're hoping it would be furnished by, you know, uh, by, by many, many partners who would be working to help build the network. All right, the next chart. The DARA system has a very nice distribution. Uh, they, of course, are what we call self-funding. Self They've got about 60 stations. 85% uh, of them are operational. Uh, there are some gaps. Uh, in the southeast and northwest Pacific area, in northern Australia, in Russia, in North Africa. So, you know, once again, these are some of the same places that uh, there are gaps with the SLR and the VLBI. Uh, they have identified no funding uh, needed in the sense that they are supporting, the, you know, their their network uh, and the you know, the, uh, the IGN and the CNES. Uh, so. Uh, Whatever building goes on there would go on uh, from uh, from their, their funding. What's uh, hoped, of course, is that uh, if there are additional stations and they can go into places that already exist, that uh, you know that they, they of course would be welcome and uh, could could build up and operate. Next one. In terms of the uh, the IGS network, um, they've got 500 operating stations. Wow. Uh, and close to 90% have provided data within the last 10 days. Now, this is, of course, when the uh, when the survey was taken a year and a half or so ago, or two two years ago. So, and presumably, it's the, the similar kind of level today. Uh, and 150, these are the highest performing core reference sites. And these are the ones that are in the in the reference frame, and the rest support. You know, a wide variety of, of uh, other applications on the ground and in space, etc. Their technology is mature, it's off the shelf, it's largely automated. Uh, so uh, the, the compatibility issue, uh, they don't have quite the compatibility issue that we might have, for instance, with the SLR. Uh, their network needs more stations, you know, better distribution. Once again, Antarctica, South Central, uh, America, Africa, Russia, China, the islands in the Atlantic, Indian Oceans, and the Pacific. So a lot of the same that we see uh, in the the other techniques. Uh, here, though, the annual cost of operations could be one hundred to ten thousand dollars a year, depending upon the infrastructure and the location. Uh, obviously, if you go to a place that's uh, highly developed, has all the infrastructure there, and uh, all you need to do is um, to operate the equipment, uh, it uh, it's much it could be much easier than going uh, to try to load a, locate a station in the middle of nowhere. A new system uh, runs about twenty thousand dollars plus the cost of the monument. So of course it's considerably smaller than the the SLR and the and the VLBI. The next, <clears throat> okay. So here's a picture of the IGS network. Uh, a lot of the stations. And once again, you can see where 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 the gaps are. Next, okay, the the IGFS, um, and we just heard a, a, a talk on it, so most of this stuff is already 
already covered. Um, so in, in their case, uh, you know, they currently, at least at the time of this, have no operating ground sites, uh, you know, aside from their, their data and their, their processing center. But in the near future, the, uh, the uh, International Height Reference Frame Service is planning to be a component of the IGFS, probably already is, uh, and will include delivery of the IHRS realization. So gravity data acquisition and continuous monitoring of the IHRS ground sites with absolute and relative gravity meters, along with first order and first class spirit leveling to properly monitor the potential of the stations. Uh, and presumably, I mean, the hope here is that uh, and as many of these will be at a core and co-location sites in the other network. So they'll be co-located uh, either with VLBI and or, uh, and or SLR at the uh, time varying contribution of the gravity field, the potential change in land deformation. So, uh, so we're hoping that this uh, sort of builds into the, the uh, combined GIGOS network uh, and uh, I would expect that you know, there might even be you know, other kinds of instruments, take other kinds of measurements that would also use the core and co-location sites as a place to, to land their equipment. Uh, next chart. Okay, I showed this yesterday. And what I wanted to really point out is I mean, we have core sites. Uh, and the expectation was that we could have something like 24 core sites. Uh, that's going to take a long time, and uh, so we best uh, make our plans based on not only the core sites that exist, uh, which are, should exist or, or will exist, but also the co-location sites. As I point here, I mean, we have a, a small number of, of course that are presently core sites that are indicated by the black dots, uh, and the, uh, the, the white dots are core sites but are operating very marginally. In other words, they do not provide enough data to really, for instance, make, a, make a, a, an effect uh, on, on the reference frame. Uh, and, um, uh, but they, they may in fact be, be supporting other projects. Uh, it can be, uh, as, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, altimeters, gravity field, and things like that. We have a few here which was uh, pointed out by, uh, by Ryan yesterday that are close but not close enough uh, for uh, core sites. Uh, some of them like uh, Sakura and Nishioka uh, might only be you know, 10 or 20 miles apart. Uh, and, and others like uh, uh, the islands in, in Hawaii uh, and uh, the ones that are, are going into uh, Tanana Reef uh, and and, uh, and such, uh, uh, Nanner, uh, and uh, Grand Canaria, uh, they're, they're 100 to 200 miles apart. So uh, we, we need to think about how we're going to connect those stations. Uh, you know, and, and one possibility is maybe each one, each station needs a, a local network of GNSS receivers. Uh, with lots of redundant baselines that are monitored continuously, uh, you know, with the, with the with the second site that has the same local area network, uh, it's not the best. It's not what we might have wanted, but it's the reality. So we need to think of what kind of strategies uh, we're going to use and how we're going to do it and make it an integral part of our measurement system uh, in, uh, in our network. So. Uh, so I think uh, the bottom line here is things are growing. Uh, they are growing more slowly than we would have predicted uh, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, there are a number of sites that are still pending that we thought would be operating a long time ago. Uh, and uh, we certainly do commend and thank those institutions that are building these pieces of equipment and operating them. And um, we'll uh, have to wait until they become uh, operational. So it's going to be a, a, a long time project here, and uh, but uh, I think we need to encourage, I think we need to advocate, uh, I think we need to help, um, I think we need to, to work with folks to help put partnerships together. If one 
one institution can do an SLR, or one can do a VOBI, uh, and we have a few cases of that now. Uh, and that uh, that maybe that's that's a, a, a way to think about how we could build this network. So once again, thank you very much for your indulgence, and uh, thank you very much for the extra time. Okay, that's it. No, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mike, for the uh, uh, presentation about the uh, uh, IAG questionnaire. Uh, the uh, presentation uh, is very helpful for us to understand the current situation and issues and challenges on the uh, current uh, the global uh, geodetic networks and also IAG services.